Welcome to Humanist Canada's webinar series. I'm Anna Popovich, Program Director with Humanist Canada. You are attending in listen-only mode. Today's webinar will be 60 minutes in length with time allotted for Q&A. Please submit your questions with the Q&A tool um, at, which you can find at the bottom of the screen and uh, we will take your questions at the end of the presentation. You can also upvote a question to move it up to the top of the list. Our topic today is understanding the Aboriginal self from a humanist lens. And our guest is Dr. Lloyd Robertson, lead psychologist with the Collaborative Center for Justice and Safety um, at the University of Regina. He has published on the structure of the self, Indian residential schools, prior learning assessment and its effects on self-development, the Aboriginal self, cultural structures that might function as mind viruses, and uh, self-mapping in treating suicide ideation and other mental health conditions. He is currently Vice President of Humanist Canada and is on our board. Uh, I should also mention that Lloyd just published a book, The Evolved Self Mapping and Understanding of Who We Are. It is available for purchase from the University of Ottawa um, at a 20% discount rate for our members and uh, webinar guests. You will receive a link to the publisher's website and a discount coupon in the follow-up thank you email from Zoom. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, thanks so much, Lloyd, for joining us. Welcome and over to you. Thank you for your kind words, Anna. I appreciate, I appreciate your comments. And now I'm going to just click on share screen here. Um, as Anna was mentioning, uh, the, the much of what I'm about to say is in, in a book that just came out last week. Uh, published by the University of Ottawa Press. Uh, the, uh, actually, the, we're going to go into a bit more detail, though, than, than is in the book. Uh, what, what is in the book is the self maps uh, that, uh, that I'm, I'm about to present to you, although you're going to receive more self maps on, uh, on the individuals, uh, so you'll be able to see a a spectrum of, of their maps over time. The first thing to, for us to do is to uh, talk about what is the human, humanist lens that we're using uh, to, to examine the Aboriginal self. And what I've listed on this page are some of the presuppositions of humanism that flow from the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, now, often humanism is thought as, as, as it, extending from the Age of Enlightenment, but I would argue that logical constancy, objective thinking, and theory of mind are at least 3,000 years old. Uh, and I call this, uh, this the, modern, the modern self, although uh, 3,000 years is, uh, is a span of time in cultural studies. Uh, what, what was a self like before that? Well, Julian Jaynes, in studying pre-Homeric Greek culture concluded that the pre-Homeric Greeks were all schizophrenic or words to that effect. David Martell Johnson studied ancient Egyptian and Greeks and concluded, quote, they didn't have minds. Uh, fast forwarding now to the modern era, uh, uh, Susan Harder studied early childhood uh, development and, and in the United States and she concluded that uh, all these kids are narcissistic. My answer to all of them is the same. It's not that they were schizophrenic or didn't have minds or, or, or were narcissistic. They just didn't have fully developed modern selves. And this is the self I'm talking about. Uh, or the, uh, This is eight qualities of the self I'm talking about. These are essential components that are cross-cultural in the, in the work I have done. And these qualities are... Uh, uh, are exhibited in people who, I'm, I'm going to put this qualifier on it, it's people who, who were not in therapy, uh, psychotherapy at the time. Uh, if one or more of these elements are missing, you'll likely have a cognitive impairment or a mental health problem. Now, in examining the, the Aboriginal self, we have to be aware of 
of our colonial history. Here you'll see a map of America in 1744. You'll see the continents are fairly well developed as far as what our modern maps would look like, uh, except for a part in, uh, uh, that, that's not, not shown, not uh, mapped in the Northwest. And, and for most of our history that was simply called, referred to as the Northwest. You notice that Canada in this map extends south of the Great Lakes. Um, Detroit, Chicago uh, are due west of, of Toronto, and that was a Canadian hinterland at that time, Canada being at that time a French colony. Uh, Canada remained uh, uh, in that shape after, uh, after uh, the defeat of France and Canada was transferred to British control in, uh, in uh, 18, no, 17, what was that, 1863, no, 1763. And um, uh, that was one of the reasons for the uh, U.S. Revolution. Uh, Canada, Canada remained economically drawing on that hinterland until after the War of 1812. And after that point, uh, Canada fell into an economic depression. Canada being uh, the business class, uh, defined by the business class in Montreal and Toronto. John A. Macdonald, in his national policy, his idea was to replace the hinterland lost south of the Great Lakes with the Northwest. Um, and to do that, he needed treaties to establish, uh, to establish primacy. Because at that point, in, uh, uh, at that point uh, in Canada's history, it was not at all clear that the Northwest was going to be with Canada or be part of the United States. As it was, the U.S. got part of it. Now, in dealing with the uh, the uh, treaties that were signed and the, uh, and the uh, acts of parliament, we have to be cognizant of the definitions being used. Uh, I'll, I'm going to share an experience I had with you when I, uh, when I visited with a Mapuche in, in, in Chile in 1991. Now, I call him a Mapuche because he was from a Mapuche community. He grew up there, but he did not define himself as Mapuche because he was a banker. He was educated. He had given up uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Mapuche way of life. That is a cultural definition of, of aboriginality. And that is a definition that you'll find in the Canadian uh, acts and the treaties uh, from, the, uh, from that era. For example, the Indian Act of 1876 said a person could cease to be an Indian by becoming enfranchised into full Canadian citizenship. Um, another, uh, another issue here is that women marrying someone without Indian status were presumed to have given up the Indian way of life and therefore they would cease to be Indian as well. That particular clause was ruled to be sexist by the Supreme Court of Canada. Now, part of all the treaties uh, was a promise of education. So uh, the government of MacDonald had, uh, had a, a duty uh, that had to be fulfilled. So one, one of the things that uh, happened is the uh, churches, four churches in particular, volunteered to, to fulfill this duty if the government would pay for the uh, uh, for the, the schools and the churches said that you pay for the schools and uh, we, will, uh, we will cover the operating costs. Uh, the government thought that was a pretty good deal and we uh, uh, had established then uh, the Indian residential school system. Uh, now, as, as we all know, that did not work out too well. The idea of the residential school system was to change the selves of the students. 
Uh, and here we have a, a, a photographic depiction of the process involved. Thomas Moore, before and after he entered the uh, residential school in, in Regina. Um, the results of this transition were unpredictable. Frankly, the, the churches did not know what they were doing. They had a caricature of a European self that they were imposing on people who already had partially developed Aboriginal selves and the results were unpredictable. In a 2006 journal article, I suggested that this created a kind of hybrid in cases uh, that, uh, where uh, dysfunctionality resulted, uh, and I called this residential school syndrome. Now, here is a, here is a question that uh, uh, needs to be answered when we're uh, involved in this discussion. Is there an essential Aboriginal self that can be, can be restored? There is a movement associated with Aboriginal spirit, spirituality trying to change Thomas Moore back again. Under this model, all Aboriginal people have been traumatized by colonialism and need to return to traditional beliefs so they can be the persons the creator meant them to be. This creates a problem for humanists. The majority of Aboriginal people in Canada are Christian and therefore not predisposed to accepting humanist values. But the alternative in this battle for souls is the Aboriginal spiritualist movement, and they see humanism as a kind of simulation flowing from the European Enlightenment. It's not all that simple. And here, I, 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 you've got a grainy picture here of the oldest building in Saskatchewan. It was built in uh, 1853. And I may be the only atheist to have performed weddings in, in, uh, in this mission. Uh, I believe the picture was taken, it was not dated when I got it, but I believe it's the early 20th century because there's still houses on the north side of the river. Um, the, there was a Hudson Bay trading post on the south side. Uh, it's now but since been replaced by a co-op store. Uh, and gradually the community moved, shifted from the north side to the south side. But before that, we had uh, Cree hunters and trappers who had trap lines in this area. After the, the church was built, gradually they, would, uh, they began settling in this area uh, and adopting the Anglican religion. This is modern Stanley Mission. Modern Stanley Mission uh, is a has a population of about uh, 1,400 people now. Uh, the, the mission is still there, but it's not in the picture because of the angle the picture was taken. Uh, the, the mission itself is to the upper left uh, of, of this particular picture. Now, Stanley Mission now is part of the Lac La Ronge Indian Band, and the band health office is, in is located in La Ronge, which is about 90 kilometers uh, from the community of Stanley Mission. Uh, in the 1990s, a local elder support worker for Stanley Mission was threatened with disciplinary action by uh, band health staff because she had uh, not been sufficiently vigorous in encouraging the local elders to adopt Aboriginal spirituality. The local elders said they recognized that their ancestors had not always been Christian, but uh, that is who they are now. They also said that certain aspects of Aboriginal spirituality, such as powwows and sun dances, had never been part of Northern Bush Cree culture. And what is very telling uh, uh, is some of the elders said that efforts to convert them to Aboriginal spirituality felt to be as oppressive as attempts by missionaries to, uh, to convert Aboriginal people to Christianity. Okay, how does all that play out in the self of people? Um, this is a person, the map of a person uh, who is from the Lac La Ronge band, and he's in his early 30s, or was when this, this map was taken. Uh, and the way I developed the map, 
is I ask people to tell me who they are, and we, we, we had long interviews, and, and from the transcribed interviews, I, uh, I teased out elemental units of culture. Now, these are not all aspects of culture. They're the smallest uh, as, uh, elements of culture that have connotative, affective, and behavioral dimensions attached to them. So, um, for example, one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, memes here listed here, uh, just picking one out at random, is a learner. A learner, positive aspect uh, to it. It uh, uh, it felt to him to be connected to being human, uh, to be a learner. Uh, he uh, the connotation uh, uh, was had to do with growth and the behavior was he actively sought uh, opportunities uh, in which he could uh, change and learn new things. Uh, hence, learner is listed there as a meme. Uh, memes uh, connect with others. The thick black line you see here is a trend of thought starting with uh, being a rememberer and that's part of how he defined himself. And he remembered being, uh, changing himself, and we'll get into that in a moment. He remembered uh, his parents uh, being alcoholic, and so he considered himself to be a potential alcoholic, uh, and so on. Uh, three months after the, developing the first map with, uh, with uh, Trevor, uh, uh, we reviewed it and we noted some changes to his map, and those changes are highlighted in yellow here. Uh, this is a sign, and this has been repeated in uh, in every longitudinal longitudinal mapping exercises I, I, I've been involved with, uh, with uh, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. Is that is that self change happens with respect to uh, an evolutionary process. There's not a wholesale process uh, change happening at any one time, but new means are added, other means are discarded, some are, uh, some are changed in some ways. Uh, this is Trevor's map after seven months. Uh, and one thing I wanted to highlight, it, highlighted in blue here, uh, are changes, the developmental changes that Trevor initiated on, on his own. He called uh, uh, these his spirit helpers, Taoism and Aboriginal spirituality. He became a, a, a influenced by Taoism when he took martial arts uh, in his late teens. And uh, he kept uh, many of the teachings of his instructor, um, uh, incorporated them into himself and kept them thereafter. When he was in his 20s, he decided that, um, that well, he had always described himself as a big Indian. And he decided that meant he was Aboriginal. You'll see that meme uh, in the lower left, lower right party, pardon me, lower right part of this, uh, this uh, slide. And so he decided to, he had to define that. And so he uh, gave tobacco to people he recognized as elders, learned to, to be a powwow drummer and singer and uh, went to sweats and uh, that is incorporated in the meme Aboriginal spiritualist. Now uh, I want to turn to a young Métis mother. Uh, The basis of Tina's, uh, 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 that's her pseudonym, the basis of Tina's self is a menu of emotions at the bottom of the, of the, uh, of the slide here uh, that trigger various clusters or memes. And the clusters include empowerment, which you also saw in Trevor's self, family, love, and one theme that she uh, uh, named good person uh, or decent person rather. Uh, being a decent person meant she was against stereotyping. She was open-minded. She was a pleaser, which is not necessarily a positive thing. And she was outgoing and caring. Now, 
there, there, there are two bars near the uh, bottom, and one smaller bar uh, involves guilt and depression. And when she was feeling guilt and depression, the highlighted beams uh, that you uh, 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 see in this picture uh, came to the fore. So what that means is that people, uh, they, they, they have the same self, but different parts of the self can be highlighted depending on the context, depending on the emotion and, and uh, sometimes unconscious factors. The core of, of uh, Tina's uh, identity was family person. That was how she uh, defined herself uh, most of the time when she was not being depressed. And you'll see highlighted here, mother, uh, love, daughter, uh, wife, and uh, tied to wife uh, was cleaner. She, uh, she was obsessive about cleaning. That was part of her personality. Okay, what do we got here? Is it culture or is it just plain living? Because there's nothing in Tina's self, although she grew up. She was the only one of the people I mapped here who grew up totally uh, uh, in an Aboriginal community and never left her Aboriginal community. She did not, there's nothing in her particular map uh, that was a marker of Aboriginality. She just, but she accepted herself as a Métis person. Uh, and and uh, her, her concerns though were practical and family centered. It might be, and I, I suggest this in one of the articles I wrote, it might be that people do not set out to create a distinctive culture. They simply form communities and live the best that they know how in those communities. And it's for later generations to look back and say, hey, that's a culture that's distinct in some ways. Here we have the map of another woman from a Métis community, this one uh, being a Southern Métis, Métis community. And um, the base of Judy's self is a feeling that, that she's a genuine, alive, and unique person. Other themes in this self include being a social being, remembering, being a decision maker, being compassionate, and the thick black lines emanating from each represent a narrative or story that she tells herself. So the memes can be thought of as, as a part of an outline of a story that she can recall uh, in particular contexts. Uh, when we co-constructed this self map, she was part of a humanist group in a metropolitan area, but she did not define herself as a humanist. Actually, she did not define herself as Métis either. And although she had a career spanning over 40 years in social work, she did not define herself as a social worker. Uh, she, she was not a humanist because of the connotation sometimes placed in the word, and so she described herself as a non-theist. She was not Métis because she did not practice Métis culture. So in this respect, she was uh, uh, looking towards an Aboriginal, uh, I mean, a party, pardon me, a cultural definition of Aboriginality. And um, she simply described herself as a, as a Canadian with Aboriginal ancestry. Here we have the self map of a self described renegade. And I'm going to break that down a little bit here. Uh, this is how maps are developmental over childhood and adolescence and, and adulthood. The yellow part highlighted here uh, with the theme challenge of authority was the first part of his self to develop. And he was raised as a Catholic and he began challenging uh, Catholicism at a, a, a very young age. Uh, he remembered uh, having a friend who is not Catholic, and uh, he said that, in his opinion, she was as entitled to go to heaven as he was. Uh, and that was the start of, of his rebellion against Catholicism. We added a bar at the bottom there to represent uh, uh, his, his emotionally driven triggers 
the, the, where sometimes this self, which he described as uh, his, uh, his immature initial self, could be triggered. Now, he was a very shy uh, adolescent and young man, and he learned to be a, a, social, a social person, a worker, and to be empowered uh, through role play. He pretended to be a worker and, 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 and uh, went through the rules, what would happen if, a, uh, if he really was a worker, and that's how he learned to be one. He pretended to be a social person and uh, forced himself to role play in social situations and thus became a social person. Um, interesting technique. Another, another, uh, the last part of the self that developed uh, was, uh, and this was in adulthood now, uh, was his, uh, the, the self you'll see at the bottom there outlined in yellow in this, in this frame. He embraced Aboriginal spirituality and became an activist on Aboriginal issues. His self included means associated with Aboriginal spirituality as a spiritual relationship with the land. He reported paranormal experiences in sweat lodges that exceeded those of most other people who participated in sweat lodge ceremonies. In both form and progression, John's self resembles that of Trevor, but there's a difference. John's genetic ancestry is German. So here's a, a question. If there is such a thing as an Aboriginal self, and if the self is a learned thing constructed from cultural means, can a non-Aboriginal person have one? Now, if you think back to the beginning slides here, um, in the cultural definition of, of Aboriginality used by the uh, Canadian government in the late 19th century, a uh, a, a Aboriginal woman, or I should say an Amerindian uh, woman, marrying a person without treaty status ceased to be Indian. Uh, <clears throat> in this case, we had a non-Aboriginal man, a person of German ancestry, marrying a Métis woman, and it went the reverse way uh, in terms of uh, cultural uh, self-development. Now, there's another way, of course, defining Aboriginality, and that's, uh, that's a, a racial definition of Aboriginality. If we accept a purely racial definition, then Trevor, Tina, and Judy are Aboriginal. Even though Judy denies that she's Métis, they're all Aboriginal. But John B. is not. But if we if use a, an essentialist cultural definition of Aboriginality, then Trevor and John are Aboriginal. Here we have the self map of a, a former client of mine, and it's reproduced with, with appropriate uh, uh, permissions. In fact, uh, I did a journal article, a case study uh, on this that was published uh, in the Canadian uh, Journal of, um, uh, uh, of Psychology. Olivia presented with post-traumatic stress disorder and she had been raped. She'd been raped by a friend following a night of heavy drinking. Police decided there was insufficient corroborative evidence to charge and the trauma of being disbelieved accentuated by verbal assaults from family members of the alleged perpetrator uh, accentuated her feeling of trauma. Her spouse, family, and work were perceived by her as being supportive. Now, as you can see from the self map, her self was divided between three mini selves labeled fitness, spiritual, social, and imperfect, with a few connecting pathways. The links between memes can be treated as cognitive pathways maintained through association and the lack of connecting links meant that there was one area with, with a, when she was in one of these areas, she tended to perseverate and stay in that area uh, uh, psychically. 
Her imperfect self included descriptors for depression, anxiety, and drinking. In this case, drinking meant heavy drinking. Over the course of, of therapy, uh, Olivia stopped being a binge drinker. Uh, in fact, within a month and a half, we were able to reduce the symptoms of PT PTSD sufficiently that she was able to return to work. Uh, she committed herself to not drinking to excess. Uh, her partner, however, continued to, to drink and, and became jealous and accused her of social climbing by not joining him in his drinking, and she eventually left him. Uh, she reported that he had been a mean drunk. Uh, she went to live alone in a family cabin in a northern community, in the boreal forest, and uh, she reported a remarkable change in, in, in her uh, mental health well-being. In fact, she scored low on a test of depression uh, during this period, uh, which I was using. Uh, she had scored high in previous administrations. Um, she no longer felt respected at work because work kept treating her like she was uh, irresponsible as her old self had been. They were supportive to a point, but would not trust her uh, uh, to, to follow through because they had not trusted her to follow through on her commitments before. Um, she uh, also felt that her family, particularly her mother, had become over controlling. They had not changed. It was she who had changed. Now, here's Olivia's self-map uh, about seven months into therapy. Illustrated in blue are new means modifying her imperfect self, leading to more self-acceptance. Illustrated in, level, in yellow are new means building her sense of empowerment, particularly as related to her family. Markers of aboriginality included the meme labeled spiritualist that included her supernatural beliefs and outdoorsy uh, which encompassed her felt relationship with nature. People's selves begin to develop out of family traditions and early experiences, and from then on are constructed by the individual, but most of the time the individual is not conscious of that, of that construction. In the course of that construction, some people um, will choose self-defining means that are associated with aboriginality. But regardless of cultural markers, all healthy individuals have a similar structure of self. And, and uh, I, this is cross-cultural. I've, I've administered these maps uh, on, uh, in both collectivist and, and individualist cultures. And I'm going to digress here a, a moment. What, uh, what what I have concluded is, is there are centers for collectivism and individualism in all of us. Uh, the difference, uh, and I go into some detail outlining this in my book, the, the difference is that modern Euro-American cultures have declared the, the individual, that individu the individual individualism inherent in the self to be a good. Uh, collectivist cultures uh, attempt to put um, control and to put um, uh, boundaries around that self. In some cultures, um, in fact, in, in, in uh, traditional Christianity, uh, the a calling was to give up one sense of self, to renounce one sense of self. Um, and what was meant by that was to renounce your sense of individualism that is inherent in the self. Uh, as I said, individualism inherent in having a self, and that is the core to the philosophy of humanism, to affirm the self-worth of every individual 
while recognizing our place in the largest collectivity, and that collectivity is humankind. Uh, that is my formal presentation. We now have, it looks to me like about 20 minutes or more, uh, for questions and answers. Uh, thank you, Lloyd, for your presentation. I see there is one question from Vincent. And the question is, don't identifiers like humanist and environmentalist incorporate indigenous views or align with indigenous values? For example, our relationships with people, earth, animals, etc. I think I agree with the supposition of the questioner here. Uh, I think environmentalism uh, is an important value and, and I think that uh, this is a cross-cultural uh, value. Uh, Anti-environmentalism is also cross-cultural and I can, I, can, I can think of examples uh, uh, going in different directions on this. I'm gonna give you an example uh, from uh, indigenous history. Uh, in the early and mid part of the 19th century, the Hudson Bay Company attempted to put restrictions on uh, indigenous trappers so that uh, the fur bearing animals would not be trapped in the spring. And the reason, of course, that the Hudson Bay Company did that uh, and refused to accept uh, beaver pelts, for example, in the spring uh, was because uh, they didn't want to run out of beaver. And this is, this is when the animals are procreating. Now, isn't it odd that a colonial organization, the Hudson Bay Company, would be uh, having to put this kind of restriction on uh, an Aboriginal people that are thought to be one with the land? Now, I'm not disagreeing with that supposition. I'm saying it's more complex. And that uh, we as human beings, um, we have a history, regardless of uh, what race uh, or uh, ethnic group we are, if we go back far enough, we have a history of entering, um, of entering different parts of the planet and, and um, driving out or over, over hunting. Uh, we have that potential now, we can see it now. And yes, uh, if we're wise, we are going to collectively think of ways of saving the environment because in the end, it's in our own best interest. I diverge a little bit, but I'm trying to read a bit more into that question than perhaps was, that, uh, was meant. Okay, um, two questions that can be uh, summarized uh, in one. You spoke of constancy in the eight characteristics that you mentioned in your second slide. Can you give me a bit, uh, a bit more of a de definition around that? Constancy of self? Okay. Uh, I'm going to interpret that question in two ways. There is one uh, part of the self that involves constancy, uh, and and uh, that might be uh, that might be a necessity of having a uh, a what I'm calling the modern self, the self that is capable of uh, of uh, objective thinking and theory of mind and so on. Uh, in order to do forward planning, or in order to think reflectively on what happened in the past, we need to uh, understand or believe that we are the same person in some sense now as we were a year ago, or that we will be the same person now as we will be a year from now. And we know that that's not absolutely true because we know that we're changing. But, there, uh, but we need to have that understanding that we can make plans and then be there 
for uh, when when those um, uh, plans br uh, are brought to fruition. Uh, that is the, uh, the, the meaning of the word constancy in those eight, uh, eight areas, those uh, eight factors that I listed on that slide. Now, there's another uh, part of that question, or what I'm interpreting to be part of that question, having to do with, uh, okay, these eight elements, they, they form a kind of structure. And it's a structure that I submit is cross-cultural, although I'm going to admit that I have not mapped every culture, but I'd be very, very surprised if there's a culture alive uh, 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 today where you didn't have a modern self. And the reason I'd be very surprised is I don't think such a culture could compete with neighboring cultures. Uh, and, and that is why once we evolve, uh, the self evolved this direction, it spread worldwide very quickly. The, the structure of the self is similar across cultures, but the uh, markers of, uh, uh, of the culture are still there. Hence, uh, in terms of the Aboriginal self, there can be markers of Aboriginality where people uh, decide, okay, I'm Aboriginal, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to go to sweat lodges. Well, that is one way of marking Aboriginality. I would argue it's not the only way, and it's not the necessary way, but it is one way. And so the structure is the same, the expression can be different. Uh, next question is from a humanist perspective, what is meant by being spiritual? By being what? Spiritual. Spiritual. Oh, that's a big question. One of the people I mapped that's in, in the book here uh, described himself as, as a humanist and for, for him, uh, his, actually I should say her, uh, she's transgender. Uh, in her case, spirituality was defined as being one with the universe. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but uh, I have sort of an idea. Um, spirituality is a word that is a loaded word for humanists. Many humanists don't like any, uh, any mention of the word because it reminds us of religion and magical thinking. Uh, if that is what is meant by spirituality, then, hey, we reject it. If we believe in, as Carl Sagan did, in uh, awe and wonder and exploration, and that's our spirituality, then, hey, that's, that's compatible with humanism. It's unfortunate, but there's many words in the English language that have a multitude of, of meanings, and that is the basis of many of our arguments is we... Uh, sometimes argue across purposes because we're taking different meanings for the same word. It was this, do you think it is important to restore Aboriginal languages? Does it feel oppressive for Indigenous people to speak English, the language of their oppressors? Is that how it is viewed by Indigenous people? Is it important to restore Indigenous languages? Uh, maybe. Uh, there is the idea that there are certain concepts in uh, language uh, that are generated by the language and are lost when you, uh, when you speak a different language. Uh, in terms of Cree, for example, uh, in Cree, the gender uh, a grammatical gender is between the animate and inanimate, not between the male and female, as you'll find in the Romance languages, in particular in, in, in Europe. Uh, now, in terms of animate and inanimate, uh, all things animate are considered to be alive, and so things like uh, stones are animate. On the other hand, the earth, aski, is not it's not animate, it's, it's inanimate, and it's conjugated differently. 
And the, the two uh, cannot easily be joined because of the difference in conjugation. So those are differences, language differences, uh, that, that we may wish to preserve for exactly that reason. Now, the reason I'm a bit hesitant is I don't want to tell anybody that, hey, you can't be a good Aboriginal person if you don't speak an Aboriginal language. I think you can be. Uh, now, speaking of Aboriginal languages, the, the, the language that is spoken uh, in meetings of the Assembly of First Nations across Canada is English. And the reason English is spoken is because uh, there's no other language, uh, and even that uh, is, uh, is tenuous because there are some uh, people in the EFN who do not speak English, they speak French. Uh, but they're a very small minority. Now, if there was an, a, 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 an indigenous language that became the, the language uh, of communication in the AFN, it would likely be Cree, because Cree is the most widely spoken indigenous language in Canada. Um, yeah, um, there's a place for English. Okay, next common question. Um, I am part of the McDougall clan but, uh, in Scotland, but who cares about clans? Most Scottish people don't care, question mark. Do many Aboriginals really care about clan tribe? Uh, this, the, the word you're saying there, Anna, is clan? Yep, clan or tribe. Uh, the question is about who cares about clans or tribes? Do many Aboriginals really care about clan or tribe? So belonging to a, a tr you know, to a clan or a tribal community. How important is that? as a marker of Aboriginal I'm identity. I'm having to think about my answer to that question. That's a tough one. Um, do a, uh, I haven't done a study, so I really don't know uh, 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 empirically what the answer would be. I could tell you that many uh, Indigenous people do, in fact, uh, care about, uh, about uh, tribes uh, or nations. Now, the term nation, I'm going to digress a little bit here. The term nation is actually a, uh, uh, a European term uh, that fit a particular, that developed a particular epoch in, in Europe, European history, and there is no equivalency in Aboriginal, uh, in, uh, that is indigenous North American history. Uh, so when we call a, a band like uh, 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 a, a, First Nation, uh, we're applying a European term to something that is non-European and doesn't really fit. Um, give you an example. Uh, Yellow Quill led a band from originally from Northwestern Ontario near the Manitoba border into Manitoba, then left Manitoba into Saskatchewan in about 1870. Uh, because he didn't want, he, he and his people did not want to sign the treaties. After settling in the Coppell area of south, southern Saskatchewan, uh, the, the Yellow Quill and the majority of his band concluded that uh, they uh, would have to sign a treaty, and they did, but they couldn't agree on where they wanted to live. So the band split into two with part of the band, about approximately 60%, going to a place called Nut Lake, and another, uh, the remainder of the, uh, uh, the band going to a place called Fishing Lake. So where you had two bands effectively, or where you had one band, you effectively had two. But there's a small group of people who, uh, who still did not want to sign a treaty. So under the leadership of Chief Kiniston, by the way, you became a chief because people followed you, that's all. Uh, and, and so uh, Kiniston led a smaller group of people uh, north, north of the North Saskatchewan River, where they lived for another dozen years, uh, hunting and 
and fishing and, and, and trapping before they decided, well, we're going to have to sign a treaty eventually. So they moved back into east central Saskatchewan, north of where the other two bands were, and uh, claimed a, 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 a reserve near the Barrier River area. Okay, what am I saying here? I'm saying here, bands were uh, historically were temporary aggregations of mostly extended family that could split and reform and develop, and these are not what we think of as nations. Um, now, if you take beyond the tribal level, there could be a national level. You could have, for example, and this does not exist, but you could have a Cree National Council United, uniting the Cree who extend from, uh, from Quebec all the way to the Rockies. That would be uh, more in keeping with what is meant by the term nation. And when I use the term uh, First Nation, I'm thinking at that macro level. Uh, this has been a, uh, a, a large debate uh, within, within the Aboriginal community with people taking very strong positions. And um, I don't know if I've answered the question, but I've sure enjoyed going around in circles on it. Um, a related question is about collectivism versus individualism. Do we develop selves that are one or the other dependent on our cultural experiences or do all humans have the potential for both innately? Yes, uh, no. The, the short answer to that is no. Uh, uh, we, don't uh, we don't become collectivist or individualist uh, uh, based on the culture. We are already both collectivist and individualist. And it's inherent in who we are. Uh, and this, this is very old. I suggest it's at least 3,000. When I say at least 3,000, it could be a lot older. If we take an evolutionary model, those who say the self developed 40,000 years ago could also be right. And we're talking about, uh, about uh, an evolved. Anyway, back to the, uh, uh, certainly, with, certainly by 3,000 years ago, we had individualism as part of ourselves. Uh, but we also, if we retain that, we also re retain our collectivism, even in so-called uh, individualist cultures. Uh, research on this, by the way, has shown that there are, uh, there's even greater tendencies towards individualism uh, in terms of free will, for example, uh, in, in uh, certain Asian cultures than they are in North American cultures. Um, in North America and Europe, uh, collectivism might be expressed through, uh, through the corporate experience. We have, we have to work together. Or it could be uh, expressed through the political experience, or it could be expressed through religion. But it's expressed somehow because it's there. The difference, the, old, the, the major difference is that in Euro-American cultures, the individualism that's already there has been declared to be a good, a good thing. Whereas in certain Eastern cultures, for example, uh, Buddhism has a no-self doctrine. Uh, uh, that's a whole different question that goes beyond uh, what the questioner is probably asking. Okay, building on that, um, here's a question from Tanya. One of the subjects of your mind maps did not identify as a social worker, Métis, or humanist. However, she did identify as Canadian and non-theist. What did being Canadian mean to her? Was it just a geographic identity because she happened to be born and brought up in a place now called Canada? That is a, that is a very good question. <laughs> um, her answer, uh, one of the quotes from her is, I'm about as Canadian as you can get. Part of her self-definition of being as Canadian as, as what you can get is that she's a, uh, an amalgam of many different, uh, 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 of many different um, uh, cultures and sources. Uh, so it was, 
it was more than just a geographic location. I think it was a loyalty to the country. And again, a related question, what is cultural appropriation? What are the boundaries of honest imitation, cultural sharing, and appropriation? All cultures, bar none, appropriate from other cultures. That's one of the ways that change and develop and grow. Now, I, when I say that, I'm going to uh, uh, be careful with my, my definition here. Uh, there, there is an alternate definition that is an essentialist definition of what is culture. And uh, the, 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 the essentialist definition would say that this is what, uh, these, these boundaries, these items, these uh, uh, propositions, these belong in one culture. So if one culture is, uh, is, is content, well, we are just talking about individualism and, and collectivism. And what, if one culture is individualist, then the other culture is, is, uh, is, uh, is collectivist. If one culture is considered uh, spiritual, then the other culture must be material and so on. Uh, that's an essentialist and I would argue very simplistic definition of, of what culture is. For me, all a culture is, is an average, an aggregate of all the people who identify with it. So in terms of Aboriginal culture, well, there is no such thing as Aboriginal culture because as Aboriginal people, there are different, there are different Aboriginal people. Uh, so uh, Métis will have a different culture than Cree, and Cree will have a different culture than, uh, than Mi'kmaq, and so on. Now, having said that, there's a lot of pro appropriation going on. For example, much of what uh, is considered Mi'kmaq culture now, currently, was actually borrowed from, from, from the Suyan people, the Dakota. <laughs> and, and, uh, and that gets into the question of, of um, when I talked about the uh, uh, Bush Cree from Northern Saskatchewan and the elders saying, well, powwows were never part of our culture. Well, they are now because of our powwows being held in Northern Saskatchewan. So culture appropriates and changes. And I think we have just a couple of minutes for one last question. Um, would you talk about uh, yourself a little bit where you grew up and uh, how it is that you began to study and work in this area and we just have about two minutes so um, if you would like to address that okay well my, my family uh, is is from northern Saskatchewan uh, I should say half of my family is from northern Saskatchewan uh, my mother was born on the uh, Sandy Lake Reserve uh, she could speak three, three languages, and one of them being Cree. Um, I, I suppose that explains my, my interest in this area. Uh, enough said. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple of questions that we didn't get a chance to uh, address, unfortunately. Apologies for that. Um, and uh, just a few things before we uh, wrap up the session. Uh, you will receive a follow-up email from Zoom with an invitation to fill out a post-webinar survey. If you have a, a moment, please do that. We appreciate your feedback as it helps us improve. Uh, and you can also suggest a speaker or a topic of interest to you that you would like to see on our webinar series. And again, the email will also include a link to Lloyd's book and the discount coupon. And on behalf of today's team, myself and Lloyd Robertson, Robertson, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Lloyd. And uh, thanks everybody. Stay safe and connected and have a lovely rest of your weekend. And thank you for moderating, Mana. Take care. Thanks. <laughs>